We're gonna swim, bike and run In the corner sun We're gonna swim, bike and run In the corner sun 2021 Thank you, Poncho Man. Welcome, everybody. It's Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by Hoka One One Master Spas, Clash USA, You Can Hyper Ice, Premium Plus Sports, Form Goggles, and of course, our Challenge Athletes Foundation. We just sent out 3,038 grants, totally $5.1 million to keep Challenge Athletes in the game of life through sport. I am so excited to have the Olympic bronze and silver medalist from Tokyo joining us. Katie Zafaris joins us from her palatial estate somewhere hidden in North Carolina. How are you doing, Katie? Hey, Bob. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, we've been, we've been doing this for, gosh, I think we go back to like 2014, 2015. It's, it's been a long, it's been a fun journey to watch. And, <laughs> and seeing you on a rainy day, uh, having really a spectacular race, Going in, this has not been the best preparation, right? You're, right. you're, you're coming off of 2019, ranked number one in the world, uh, win the grand final. If the Olympics are 2020, everything is, is smooth sailing. Take me through how you dealt with the fact that everything was delayed a year. Well, we decided, so because of the delay, it was kind of deciding whether we push through with races and keep the same mindset and rhythm or take a step back to make sure that um, we just have the the energy physically and mentally for 2021. So, and also in 2020, when, we, when COVID first was impacting things, we didn't really know when racing would happen and if it would happen. And so Joel, my coach really recommended like doing other things that we might not do during a normal season. For instance, um, we went, we came to Cary, North Carolina, um, just to check out the area because Tommy and I have been deciding where we want to live in the world. And uh, ultimately we decided East coast and we found Cary, we checked it out and we loved it. So, and now we have a house here. So I'm really glad that Joel let us do that during, <laughs> during 2020, but um, I spent most of the time at my parents' house uh, in Maryland, and well, Tommy and I spent most of the time there, which was because when when we left our camp in Claremont because of the races and uh, the Olympics being postponed, we just rented a rented a van, drove the fifteen hours or so um, up to Maryland, and stayed there until until we started racing again. And actually, like. Um, I'm sure we'll get to this, but my, my, my dad passed away, um, in this year. So for me now, when I look back, it was such a blessing to, to be with them for that extra time last year. So I'm really glad that that's what we decided to do. It, it gave me some, some bonus time that I wouldn't have had if I was traveling the world or at the Olympics or whatever that might've looked like. So it, it all worked out, um, to, to make some special moments. Well, especially because dad was the one who got you into this, right? He, he first try, one of your first tries was Father's Day with dad. And, and then when, you, uh, when things are start, starting to open up again and it looks like they're going to have the qualification, you know you've got to go to Yokohama. And um, that's the, the, really the last place you can get a, a spot, a guaranteed spot. But this is what, like less than two months after your dad passed? Uh, how how hard was it to to try to refocus after such a traumatic experience? Yeah, I mean, Yokohama was a month after my dad had passed away. So um, I had gone home for two weeks and spent time with my family in Maryland where triathlon wasn't a priority or even really a thought. I, I exercised kind of. I would do like a run or something per day. Um, but I just wasn't, it wasn't the focus and I don't regret that at all. Um, but then ultimately had to, had to get back to things and I knew what dad would want me to do. I knew I'm, like my whole family was getting back into triathlon, doing everything that he'd been on this journey with me for. And so it was really hard, um, to leave my family. It was really hard to, um, get back into training wasn't as hard because, um, I actually, it like kind of 
uh, gave my brain something to occupy it and to be with my group. They were be with my training squad and Joel and um, was really good. And like, I just didn't want to do anything alone. So rather than work my way into like the workouts again or take any time, like the first day, I think I got back. Um, we had a run and Joel had put on my schedule, like a 75 minute easy run, but the rest of the group was doing like an hour 45. And uh, I think it was like a 5k tempo with five by one K. And he's like, what do you want to do? I said, I just want to do that. <laughs> so, cause I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be alone with my own, with my own thoughts. Sure. So, so I, I was actually doing okay with that, but getting to Yokohama, it was really tough because I think with just maybe being a little bit premature to my readiness uh, yeah. to get back on the race course. Uh, but also I, I believed in myself that I might be able to, to qualify or to have a good result. So it wasn't like I went expecting not to, but it was harder than I thought. And there were a lot of restrictions in Yokohama with um, we were, I was confined to, well, everybody was confined to their rooms by themselves. Um, and so it was already kind of stressful. And then on top of that, I, I thought that my dad passing away would hit me after the race, but it kind of hit me the day before. And I think with just the, um, everything compounding from my dad and, the how much the race me meant qualification yeah. wise yeah. and getting back on the race course so um it I, I struggled with it but i raced and i'm proud of how i kind of managed it the result by number didn't look that great but um for me i knew i needed to do the first race since my dad passed away i knew it was going to be different for me and um I, I was amazed by how many people from the triathlon community like the people on the race course officials like coaches uh support crew so many people were just so supportive and really there for me like before the race after like all the way through oh, i mean they, they still are that i think that's what made the olympics so special is how close i got into people because they've been here they've been there for me at my lowest moments <laughs> well yeah it's funny if there's one picture from the olympics that stands out it's uh <laughs> it's Flora Duffy jumping yeah. up and down, being so happy for you. Because I think that's what our sport is about. It really is a, a, a community thing where it's you against the course. And yeah, you're racing the other people, but you seriously care about those other people. And you want them to have their best race as well. The, the, when you look at that photo, I bet that brings smiles to your face. Yeah, I mean, for sure. That was a special moment with Flora. She knew, she knew exactly how much it meant to, to me to be on that podium after, after this year. And I think that just like, yeah, Flora and so many other people, they made, they were, they knew how much it I'd gone through to, to kind of get there. And so they were there for me when it wasn't going well, but then when it did go well, like it was really cool just to see how all the messages and feel all the love from everyone. Exactly. So, uh, the after you had Leeds and you had Yokohama and now it's up to discretion, just like four years ago, right? It was like, there was a couple of qualifying races and it came down to discretion. Uh, how tough was that for you waiting to find out if you were going to get chosen or not? Honestly, a little bit of it was just a little bit easier or less stressful than trying to call it to like doing the last two races under like, not the most, not the best preparation. And so once that was done, I mean, I knew I did everything that I really could for this year, but also from when the Olympic qualification process started. And so when it was out of my control, I could almost breathe easier because it, even though like it was waiting for selection and that's nerve wracking in itself, it, there was nothing I could do at that point. I'd placed all cards on the table. And I knew that I was confident in my ability, like given six weeks to just train and get in a rhythm that I would be ready for the Olympics. But um, the selection committee had to be confident in that too. And so that was really the part, I guess, that I was really unsure of was, were they confident in me as well? And did they think, because 
I think part of it is like, if you look at an athlete who gets injured or something like that, like a lot of people know like, oh, that athlete will be back as soon as their injury heals or as soon as they're good to go. I think when you lose someone and you see someone go through something emotional, my concern was that they would think that I was like changed for changed for good. And so I feel like my situation wasn't necessarily relatable. So I was scared that they would think Katie's not there anymore. And I just wanted to, wanted them to know. And I hope that they knew that I was still there. (laughs) Did they talk any conversations at all? Or was it just, did they just called you and said you're, you're chosen? Uh, They called and said we're chosen. And um, I had talked to like um, some of the high performance team as well. Mm -hmm. And we were able to provide like insight into just um, where we were at, like training and um, just how I felt, I guess. Like I was just able to, to say, I like, this is my explanation for these two races. Like, and this is, but I, I felt very confident that I would be good to go. So the good news is you're chosen for your Olympic team. The bad news is it's on a course where you crashed in 2019 and broke your nose and had over 20 stitches in your mouth. Any trepidation going back on that course? No, because it was such a random crash. Like it wasn't really the course. It was more me Um, (laughs) because it was, it was just the silly lack of focus where like, I crashed going, I crashed going straight because the road went from no barriers to barriers. Yeah. And so I hit one of the barriers that was there. And so I wasn't, I actually like my memories of Tokyo from doing the test event and from doing like the course previews in 2019 was I really liked the course. I really liked the flow of the course. And um, so that trumped the, the crash. And that was good because maybe if it would have been like a more technical section or something else, like I would have had more like, Oh, this course is scary or, Oh, this, this is unsafe. But because of how I crashed, it was like that, that won't, I won't let that happen again. (laughs) So, so a lot of times when we see the, you know, WTS races, um, there's usually a group off the front and then the second group usually catches up. At some point, there's it's hard for people to stay away. There's 18 turns on that course. Was there any conversation with the, the group? You're out of the water, you know, like third out of the water, and there's a group of seven. Did you guys talk and say, listen, let's let's keep it to seven of us, and we're going to have three medals. We don't want these guys to bridge because we've got Nicola Spirig back there. You got some, obviously, everybody's talented, but keeping it to seven was obviously preferable. I mean, for sure. Like, I think like Jess and Georgia and I and have raced before, like all of 2019, we were able to get a lot of breakaways. And so we never really had a convert. I don't think we ever had a like clear conversation about it, but we, I just assumed everyone was on the same, <laughs> same yeah. mindset with that. We were going to go and we didn't want anyone to be coming up on us and that it would be better just to ride really hard. I mean, that's how I prefer to race. It, it's, it's an ideal, it was an ideal situation. It's not always the one that works out, but when I found myself in it, I was super excited, yeah, exactly. <laughs> especially because Flora and uh, Jess and Georgia, and they're all quite good technically, especially in the rain. It was nice to be with a small group and it was nice to be with such skilled riders that I really trust and that I've ridden with before and to follow their lines and um, just really be confident that was that was also a really good bonus was your dad on your mind during that bike ride oh so not for the whole thing but part way through we saw well i i say we because i thought other people would see it but i asked them and nobody else saw it um i, I saw, saw a rain- <laughs> yeah <laughs> i saw a deep. rainbow and i was like just thinking like hey dad because like i knew he was going to be there with me like that wasn't a doubt in my mind that my dad would be watching over me during that race but uh i really appreciated the fact that he made it so obvious um and it was just i just saw it for a moment and i just said a little hey and then like went back to focus on on the course but 
I asked the girls afterwards, I said, Oh, did you guys see the rainbow during like during the bike? And they're like, how, how did you see a rainbow like during the ride? And I was like, I don't know. I guess I was just, maybe he told, maybe it was him pointing me in the right direction to take a look. <laughs> I love that. So we've chatted before. You said one of the turning points of your career was Rio and you came away from Rio because uh, you all, you knew about the uphill, but the, the, the scariness of that downhill made you at the end of the day, it made you the triathlete you are today. Talk a little yeah. about just how that, that race and that course transformed your career. Yeah, I think that just my disappointment in myself for the race and how I handled it and just kind of the, I feel like what I realized after Rio was I'd kind of been a passenger for a triathlon where I'm like, oh, I'm new to the sport. I'm just following directions from the other people who are around me, whether that's the coach or like leaders that I know, but I wasn't really taking ownership necessarily mm -hmm. in my uh, career. And so after Rio, it really became clear. It's like, okay, like before Rio, I worked with a sports psych, but it was really reactively. It was only when I had a problem and I went and I was already overwhelmed and nervous and anxious. And then I was like, oh, I need to talk to someone versus after Rio, I like wrote an email to um, the USOPC saying, I really would like to have like mental health services and have a sports psychologist. Here are my strengths. Here are my weaknesses. Who do you think would be the best person for these particular, like for me, not just for like anybody, but for my particular uh, specificities, I guess. And so I got matched with Karen Kogan, who's been my sports psychologist ever since then. And I actually, um, she was in Tokyo. So it was really cool because most of our relationship has been long distance because of just me traveling all the time. But actually in Tokyo, she got to see one of my race. She got to see the individual race for the first time. And we got to like talk in person. But I talked to her probably on average once or twice a month and always have it on the schedule. Always talk to her, even if I'm feeling good. And it just helps me stay a lot more level and just kind of keep fresh all the skills I learned. And then like, I would say just like working on the bike skills and things became a lot more intentional and making them really race specific so that, um, so that I was ready and just, yeah, just little things of all the little things that added, added up between Rio and Tokyo. I feel like a lot of it was just being a lot more intentional and making sure that the team around me was the right team. Right. And by that, I mean like sports psychologists, strength, nutrition, coach, well, coach and teammates. I've just been very fortunate to have been with Joel since 2014. So that's awesome. Um, and then we're watching on TV and Georgia goes by and has a silver. And I'm thinking, show us what's behind Katie. Is there anybody back there we have to worry about? Could you see uh, as you're because there were so many different turns? Could you see how, how much of a gap you had on fourth? Yeah, I could see a little bit. But at the same time, I always until I cross that finish line, you're just never sure like what's going to happen, how fast they can close, how fast like or how like how different my pace will change. So it was really just trying to, I, I tried to go with Georgia when she passed me. It didn't, I wasn't able to. So then it was like, okay, how do I keep my rhythm? Like not letting the fact that she had both floor and Georgia had, or had passed me like get to my head or anything and just be really confident that um, I could still finish with a good result and also just try and stay in that moment, stay focused, keep my rhythm and just kind of not, not deteriorate. <laughs> I remember the first ever Olympic triathlon, you know, McKeeley Jones from Australia got the silver and we were talking afterwards and she goes, you know, there's some races where I don't win and I feel like, you know, gosh, I, I really resent having the silver. She goes, you know what? I won the silver today. And, and I felt that way with you. I felt Katie won the bronze today. She, she had the best race she could possibly have. I mean, I for sure felt that way. I've told a couple people, but I was thinking like after 2019, if I would have gotten like the bronze medal, I think maybe I would have been a little more disappointed or have different feelings towards it after 20, 2020, 2021 and like everything to get to, to even the Olympics and, 
uh, I just felt like, <laughs> like, like I'm still on, I'm still on a high. I'm still super excited and really proud. And I think it's made even more special with um, all the, all the hard times, but, um, and also just the whole, like the community and the amount of people who I know had like helped me regroup this year. I mean, but there's a ton of people who just helped me in my journey in general. <laughs> um, but I like, I think just, it feels like such a bigger thing to me. And I, I don't think I realized how much it would mean to me. Well, and then it's like you're playing with house money when you go to do the relay, because <laughs> you've got your, you've, you've won your Olympic medal. Of course you want to win another one and become, I think you're the only American with two medals in triathlon, right? I am. Yep. Yeah. Look at that. Um, <laughs> So but going into the, uh, the mixed relay, which I think is so much fun. I think people who were exposed to triathlon for the first time by watching the mixed relay have become triathlon fans because it's, it's for you, it's like 20 minutes of high intensity racing and you got to lead it off. How fun was that? Very fun, very nerve wracking because I've never, I've done multiple team relays and I've never let off a relay. So it was my first time in that position, um, but I had our team was Kevin McDowell, uh, Taylor Nib, and Morgan Pearson. And Taylor, once Taylor was chosen to be on the team for the mixed team relay, uh, we were kind of messing around with what, how we were going to go and uh, what the order was going to be. I've always enjoyed being third because I like the fact that you can make a difference in that leg. Like, a, right. um, and however, when we were deciding, I just asked Taylor, I said, Taylor, like what position are you most comfortable in? And she said third. And I said, okay, I'll go first. And I mean, I was really happy because the, the leg, like the first leg, it was, I executed exactly as the best that I could and um, gave a little bit of a gap to the other, the other group. So we got a little breakaway, which is what we were, we were hoping to happen. Yeah. And the, the buzz around the different relays, right. They had, you know, they, they've had in, in multiple sports, they added the relays. And I thought the way the triathlon worked was way better than swimming, swimming where they had guys against girls. And I just didn't think that was as, as it wasn't as much fun to watch. I thought that the, the men, the, uh, the way that you guys did the mixed relay, relay was very cool. So getting a silver and getting a bronze and how did that, in terms of the media, in terms of things that happen afterwards, has it been crazy? Yeah, it's been a bit of a whirlwind because after my individual, I did a lot of media. I think I was gone for like seven hours that night after the race. Um, but really like, it wasn't so draining, I think, just because it was giving me energy and I thought it was really neat. Like, um, I got to be doing it with the swimmer, the breaststroker, Lydia, who had just won her gold medal. And then um, two of the synchro synchronized divers were, were doing the media around me. So it was really cool meeting them and then also being on the Today Show. And yeah. uh, that was really fun. Um, so it was just like a really cool a really cool experience and then it was even more fun after the relay because then we had our whole team doing it together which was really enjoyable and we really like our team really got to know each other even better during our lead up into Tokyo um, or our lead up into the race I should say where it was just really fun getting to know everybody just a little bit better so that I think come race day we had such a such a good camaraderie and um, a good rhythm that it just really felt it just really felt like a team and um, I knew we were, we were all going to do the best that we could for each other, which I mean, you do in everyone, but sometimes it just feels a little different, a little more close. So you're racing Montreal coming up. It's not like you're taking much time off after coming back from the Olympics. How many races are you going to be doing for the rest of this year or right next to this fall? Well, the total number of races, is going to be maybe nine. Um, I have six to seven in a row coming up. Well, yeah. I have I have possibly seven in a row coming up. Uh, we're we're firming down the schedule right now. But uh, yes, I was at, I was getting asked afterwards. Oh, you're gonna 
take a break and relax. And it was like quite the opposite. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing that, but um, I'm excited. I, I do have energy. Like, I feel like for me, it almost felt like Tokyo was the beginning of my season. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so while there might not be so much training happening because of all the racing, I'm going to hopefully use the races to keep the momentum going. <laughs> So you're, will next year be, will you continue on WTS, ITU, uh, circuit, you step, you step up to 70.3? What are your thoughts? Is it too early? Too early. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. I think we, my priority and Tommy's priority is to start a family, but obviously that timeline might not be under our our decisions. So I, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. I would like to do a bit of 70.3s and try to da start dabbling in the longer distance, um, especially next year, because I think it'd be a fun time to do it. And um, it's something that really excites me. And I feel like I'm just going to keep doing what I love doing until until it, there's something else on our horizon. Katie, what have you learned about yourself through this, through this whole process? that I have like the best community ever around me and the, the most awesome family, friends, sponsors, coach, teammates, triathlon community, everything. Um, and that, that I can, I can learn how to deal with anything <laughs> almost. <You really> <laughs> so um, I think, I think it's just to me, I never, I never would have thought that, triathlon well I didn't at some points I didn't even know triathlon would be a part of my life and then I never knew that triathlon would take me to so many places and that these achievements would even be anything that I would be I would be able to say with my name <laughs> so, so um, it's very cool <laughs> I, I always think back to you know, dad driving you out to Colorado Springs when you were invited as a steeplechaser who had some swimming background to come out to Olympic training center and potentially try this sport of triathlon and you're what an hour outside of Colorado Springs. And you, you like all of us going to our first summer camp started crying and like, I don't think I could do this. And, and but dad was there to basically reassure you that you were going to be okay. And look, look at the journey since then. Yeah. I'm really happy that I never had to call him back to pick me up. <laughs> Just call him back to join me a few more times. I love it. Katie, congratulations on bronze and silver and just, just being so resilient. Just uh, after being able to work with you for this last five, six years has been really a treat because you've gone through, you've gone through hell and you've come out the other side stronger every single time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Katie Zavaris has been our guest again, a bronze and silver medalist from Tokyo. Again, Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. See ya. Bye.